Formative Feedback, Using Digital Recording Tools to Capture and Share Writing Conferences. Thank you for taking a look at this video. My name is Jennifer Ward, and I'm a high school English teacher just outside the Philadelphia area. I was frustrated with how I was giving feedback and how my students were accessing and using that feedback. So I took some time to research and to also talk with other teachers about how they were using feedback in the classroom to support their student writers and how technology might be a good tool for us to use, especially when it comes to writing conferences and conferring with students. So why feedback? For as long as there has been writing, there have likely been teachers of writing. And for as long as there have been teachers of writing, there have been questions about how to respond to student writing. When do I provide feedback? How much? What kind? If you do a quick glance at the Amazon search results for books on feedback, you'll get a quick sense of just how much we struggle with providing feedback in a variety of different situations. But you would think that as someone who has been teaching high school English for over a decade, that I would have figured out all of these strategies to provide students with feedback on their writing in ways that both engage and empower their revision. But no. I struggle with providing feedback more so now than when I started teaching. As a teacher in a suburban high school just outside of Philadelphia, I work with a diverse population of students. Some of my students walk into my 10th grade classroom on their first day chuck full of writing advice from SAT tutors and college preparatory programs. But I also have students whose parents did not attend college, who don't have a great deal of support at home, and who struggle to form a correctly punctuated sentence. In our 90 minute block schedule, I typically interact with between 60 and 90 students per semester, which averages out to between 120 to 170 teenage writers each year. How do you get that many students writing often, revising often, and have the time to provide meaningful feedback that empowers reflection and revision, not just on a single written work, but also how you engage them with their composing process overall? So I needed to hear how other teachers were tackling the feedback problem, and that's how this research got started. I put together a short online survey. And using social media, I asked writing teachers to respond to questions about their feedback process. I heard back from 25 teachers who hail from my district and neighboring districts in Philadelphia, as also, and also from as far away as England and the West Coast to Canada. A majority, 14 of the respondents, were high school English teachers, but I also had teachers respond who are currently working in higher education, elementary schools, and who work as support staff. My hope was to find out how comfortable teachers are with providing feedback to their student writers, learn from their successes, hear where there might be some common pleas for support, and think about how digital tools might be leveraged to improve how we provide feedback to our student writers. Here's a little bit of what I learned. Of the 25 teachers who responded, only three teachers reported feeling that they had successful strategies in place to provide their practicing writers with feedback. And all three of those teachers reported using individual verbal writing conferences to connect with students. Nine out of the 25 teachers reported feeling they had some good strategies in place that helped students reflect on writing choices, but felt that there were likely some better strategies they could use to provide students with feedback. The largest proportion of teachers reported feeling that they still had much to learn about providing feedback and a majority of teachers felt overwhelmed by the paper load. There were two themes that emerged from the teachers' responses that did not seem to connect with how they felt about their use of feedback. Teachers that responded that they had successful strategies in place to provide feedback, as well as those that responded that they were struggling, all mentioned two areas of concern. One was the type of feedback they provide, and two was the amount of time it takes. When asked, what do you struggle with in terms of providing student writers feedback, eight of the respondents mentioned a concern with overcorrecting student written work. One ninth grade teacher wrote, quote, I struggle with the balance of correcting errors and giving overall feedback. I know that making corrections does not help the students learn how to do it themselves, end quote. A similar concern was voiced by a creative writing and 11th grade teacher when she wrote, quote, in creative writing, I struggle with overcorrecting. I have to watch my comments to make sure that they are accurate for the writer, but aren't related to a type of style I prefer. In academic setting, I struggle with providing feedback during the writing session. 
I am much better at articulating what I'm looking for and how to approach a prompt when the essay is complete. I can see what's missing better than I can guide early on, end quote. It is the fear of the dreaded red pen that looms over these comments. Writing teachers struggle with when to address errors and mistakes. And we also struggle with time, specifically that there just isn't enough of it. 11 of the 25 responding teachers expressed a strong desire for more time to respond to student writing. An 11th grade English teacher from a suburban public school responded, quote, doing it in a timely fashion while also making it meaningful. I can grade quickly or I can grade thoroughly. I can't do both and neither is truly quick, end quote. Another high school English teacher from Canada responded, quote, it's hard to find time to give specific feedback for each student, especially when they have such a wide range of needs, end quote. So what's at the root of these two concerns? Why all this concern about not having enough time to correct papers? As English teachers, we talk about correcting papers or grading papers. Both are acts which put the teacher in the role of the sage who is handing down knowledge, whose role is to evaluate how well our student writers have performed. The emphasis on this act of grading or correcting is not really indicative of what the student is learning. We know from the process theorists, from writers like Peter Elbo, Donald Murray, Donald Graves, that slapping a grade on a piece of student writing does little to motivate student reflection or revision. We know that circling every mistake with the dreaded red pen does more to shut down our practicing writers than it does to inspire their engagement with composing. Yet, we continue to circle misspelled words and misplaced commas. Why? One of the early and most influential proponents of the current traditional approach to teaching rhetoric was Edward T. Channing, chair of the Boylston Professorship of Rhetoric and Oratory at Harvard College in the early through mid 19th century. It's his work outlining rules for correct grammar, style, and organization in composition that continues to reverberate through our primary and secondary teaching of writing to this day. His approach passed down through his predecessors and through the secondary writing teachers who hoped that their students would attend prestigious schools like Harvard, helped to define a canon of literature, how readers discuss that literature, as well as how we taught writers. The current traditional rhetoric, CTR, focuses on writing style to the near exclusion of anything else. Theorists of this approach believe that writing is linear, meaning that because writers know what they want to write before ever laying pen to paper, the act of composing is a process of selecting the most appropriate rhetorical form for the work. There is no back and forth, no revision or rewriting, except to correct style mistakes. Writing, as understood by these current traditional rhetoric theorists, is not connected with invention or thinking. The act of teaching writing, then, is one of helping edit the stylistic choices of the writer. As such, the CTR is focused on the product of writing. As long as the finished piece of writing follows the grammatical and rhetorical conventions, it's an acceptable work of composition. Such a formulaic and prescriptive approach to teaching writing does simplify how writing is assessed, making this approach easy to both teach and grade. We're focused on a set of rules. And it is this tradition, this focus on assessment, that continues to impact our teaching today. Just take a look at your Common Core State Standards rubric for expository writing. How much of that rubric addresses invention or critical thinking or rhetorical choices that the writer has made to fit the writing situation versus how much of that rubric is dedicated to correct grammar, the variety of sentence length, use of correct number of supporting details, or the presence of a thesis statement. However, it's not simply the shift in how to give feedback that changes how students engage with feedback. The process approach, which stemmed as a reaction to the current traditional approach, changed our understanding of the importance of agency. In the current traditionalist approach, teachers were the seed of knowledge. Teachers held all the knowledge about composing, which they then bestowed upon their students. However, the process approach is student writer centered. The seed of ownership and agency is with the writer. In her book, Right Beside Them, Penny Kittle writes of a writing class with Donald Murray in which another class member handed, handed Kittle back a draft of her essay marked with feedback and corrections. Kittle wrote in her own notebook of the experience, quote, you smile as you hand it to me, so efficient and sure you're right, but your movements on my work are yours 
not mine. Worse, they're insulting, distancing, shocking. I'm unable to look you in the eye, end quote. As a teacher of writing, Kittle realized that her students feel, felt much like she did when their written work came back marked with corrections and comments. Their work had been invaded. Their agency and ownership over their own writing had been taken away. And so the work of the writing teacher is to find ways to use feedback to help grow student writers as they write, but in such a way that the student writer maintains authority and agency over their own work. What I find interesting is that even though many of us have read and used the elements of the process approach to teaching writing, such as free writing, writing workshops, conferring, where we struggle with providing feedback is when we return to that more formulaic approach to teaching writing. We need to stop thinking of ourselves as editors of our student writing and start thinking of ourselves as coaches who facilitate writing opportunities and discussions. We don't want to graduate students who are simply good copy editors. Our goal is to develop thoughtful and reflective writers who are able to revise their composition based on the purpose and audience of their writing. And this is at the heart of editing versus revising. In a 2013 English Journal article titled A Formative Assessment System for Writing Improvement, San Diego State University professors and high school teachers Nancy Frey and Douglas Fisher surveyed nearly 550 high school students about their experiences with feedback and grading. Not surprisingly, Frey and Fisher found that the students echoed much of what process and post-process composition theorists have been writing about for decades. Quote, when feedback focuses on a summative task, such as an essay or research paper, it's not likely to change students' performance because there's no opportunity for students to redo or rethink the work, end quote. Even when writing teachers did require students to resubmit final essays, students were dutifully compliant in making requested corrections, but there was little evidence of advanced reflection and revision of their written work. The students made only those edits requested by the writing teacher, but continued to make similar mistakes in the next writing assignment. This is the same phenomenon that Peter Elbow, Donald Graves, Lucy Calkins, and many other teachers of writing explored in the 1980s and 90s. In his piece from the College English Journal published in 1993, titled Ranking, Evaluating, and Liking, Sorting Out Three Forms of Judgment, Peter Elbow explains that this process of ranking student work following the crafting of the composition often works to deter the type of reflection on rhetorical choices that we hope to foster in our practicing writers. Instead, student writers focus on the grade, on editing only the parts of the writing that the teacher has critiqued. Quote, ranking leads students to get so hung up on these oversimple, quantitative verdicts that they care more about the scores than about learning, Elbow writes, more about the grade we put on the paper than about the comment we have written on it, end quote. Students asked to rewrite a work then simply obey teachers rather than carefully considering the merits of our suggestions. At its worst, Elbow as well as Frey and Fisher state that our hours spent writing feedback on final essays works only as a justification for our grades rather than as a tool to encourage reflection and revision on the part of our student writers. And this is supported by what Frey and Fisher's students reported. When asked about the feedback that they received following extended writing tasks, over 80% of Frey and Fisher's high school students stated that they attended to feedback only, quote, to know what grade I got and generally how I did, end quote. However, when these same students were asked about feedback they found most helpful as they drafted compositions, 92% of the students responded that they would like feedback to improve their writing. 84% also wanted, quote, specific and detailed information about my performance, end quote. And nearly half of the students wanted feedback on their, quote, understanding of the content, end quote. Frey and Fisher's group of high school writers were less focused on grades during the formative stages of their writing and more focused on the quality reflection and revision necessary to grow writing confidence. The shift to a process approach to writing, giving feedback to students during the writing process rather than after, and conferencing with students as they write expands and enlarges the students' writing experiences. Feedback giving during the composing process helps the student writer learn from his audience. As Nancy Summers states in her piece titled Responding to Student Writing, published in the Journal of College Composition and Communication, providing student writers feedback in the midst of their composing helps to, quote, dramatize the presence of a reader to help our students to become that questioning reader themselves. End quote. 
And it's this idea that student writers benefited more from formative rather than summative feedback on their writing that led to the popularity of teachers engaging in verbal writing conferences as a means of providing practicing writers with a more meaningful and timely way of providing feedback. Conferring with students isn't about fixing the particular errors in a particular piece of writing. Instead, as Lucy Calkins suggests in her book, The Art of Teaching Writing, quote, we are teaching the writer and not the writing. Our decisions must be guided by what might help this writer rather than what might help this writing, end quote. The act of conferring is a dialogue between writers about rhetorical choices, and those conversations support the writer, not simply a single piece of writing. The goal of the writing conference is to provide a student with supportive feedback and a writing strategy that she can use in her current writing piece as well as in her future compositions. And it is this conversational approach to providing feedback that's incredibly powerful. Conferring with students maintains the student writer's authorial control over his work and opens greater opportunities for teachers to have conversations with the writer about his rhetorical and content choices. Rather than the one-sided feedback that students get through a teacher's written comments, Writing conferences encourage reflection and support the student's autonomy. But opening up a space during class to engage in writing conferences requires time. Both Kelly Gallagher and Carl Anderson write about the shift that happens when teachers begin to implement writing conferences as their strategy for providing student writers with feedback. Rather than spending a majority of our time responding to the final polished writing pieces our students turn in for a grade, we need to shift our time so that we provide more feedback as they write this is a more valuable use of our efforts to support our emerging writers. And feedback through digital tools can help us do that. Many students and teachers are now using collaborative online writing tools like Google Docs to turn in written assignments. Students know they have access to help when and wherever they need it. Learning and writing are no longer confined to the classroom. The teacher-student relationship is no longer confined to the physical space. So, as my students are working on a writing piece, it's not unusual for them to message me or shoot me a quick email to ask a question about a sentence or a paragraph idea. And wherever I happen to be, in front of a computer or shopping for groceries, that little ping on my phone alerts me that a student is working on developing their writing. It makes me smile. I have to oblige. And so I send off a quick response, a question, to guide the revision. But as you can imagine, a few days before a writing piece is due, those pings multiply, becoming a cacophony of unmanageable requests for feedback. I see students engaging deeply in the process of their writing as they request feedback, but those requests are often last minute and many times requesting help with editing rather than support for the larger revision issues. So how do I spend less time answering email at all hours and encourage more meaningful revision and reflection on writing? Well, combining the writing conference with technology. Many students and teachers are using Google products and shared folders to turn in written work. Digital tools like the shared folders within Google Drive make it easy for teachers and students to give feedback on each other's work throughout the drafting process, since both can access each other's writing at any time, either in school or outside of it. In addition to using the comment feature found in Google Drive products to provide written feedback to student writers, there are also a number of add-on features which make it easy for both teachers and students to access audio recordings embedded within a specific writing document. And accessing such tools will make it easy for teachers to record their writing conferences. Why record them? When writing conferences happen in the presence of other students in the classroom, there's the added benefit of supporting other writers in the room who happen to overhear. Penny Kittle writes about this in her book, Right Beside Them. Quote, students want to hear what other students are writing about and will listen in, doubling or tripling the value of that writing conference. Writing depends on talk, end quote. So it only makes sense that using audio recording tools to capture and share those conferring moments can become a powerful tool for providing feedback to student writers. Co-director of the National Writing Project at Rutgers, Sarah Bauer, published an article in 2011 in the English Journal on her experiences using audio comments to provide feedback to her high school writers. In her article, When I Stopped Writing on Their Papers, Accommodating the Needs of Student Writers with Audio Comments, Bauer writes, quote, audio feedback enables my comments to become much more developed and targeted to the individual writer than they had been when I confined myself to cryptic and cramped notes written in the margins, end quote. Using audio commentary allowed Bauer to more clearly develop her reactions to a student's written work, and in doing so, open up opportunities for her students to reflect on their rhetorical choices. 
Bauer's comments were not limited to fixing grammatical or content areas, but instead focused on how she responded to her students' work as an interested reader. What did the writing evoke in her as a reader? What did it make her wonder? Where did her understanding break down? Quote, the practice of making audio comments goes beyond assisting students with revising a particular assignment. Bauer writes, I was able to target my instructions so that students could learn about themselves as writers and develop strategies for avoiding common pitfalls on future assignments, thereby strengthening their writing performance over the year, end quote. Similar to Sarah Bauer's experience, Professor Jeff Summers, in a recent volume of the Journal of College Literacy and Learning, writes about the power of recorded voice responses to his student writers, an activity he calls Response 2.0. He writes, quote, response 2.0 can be fuller, deeper, and broader than written response because most teachers can speak faster than they can write or type. And the technology itself frees audio and video responders from the constraints of space on the printed page or of text, end quote. Summer's review of how university writing professors are using audio and video commentary to give feedback to student writers gives writing teachers from all levels ideas for how technology may be able to help our practicing writers reflect and engage more meaningful with their writing endeavors. So here's my idea. I'm going to go back into my classroom and the next time that I hold a writing conference, I'll pull the student's document up on Google Drive along with an add-on like Kazima which is an audio recording tool. And I'll record the conversation that both my students and I have about her paper. And by recording that conversation, not only will my student be able to go back and access that conversation, review that feedback at her leisure in order to help her revise her work, but by using a shared folder, if she opens up the privacy setting to that document, not only will she have the benefit of that writing conference, but so will other students in the class who can see it in that shared folder. I thereby create a library of writing conferences and students have access to those writing conferences and tools for revision at the time they need them. Using audio tools to record and collect writing conferences with suggestions and strategies could potentially help my practicing writers. Thank you for listening to this video on formative feedback and my thoughts on how audio tools and recording might be used to help with the writing conference process. Don't hesitate to shoot me an email or find me on Twitter if you have any questions. Thanks.